She's walking around my neighborhood, walk past a Girl Scout selling cookies at a table with her mom next to her. I walked close to the table. I saw the Girl Scout was signing autographs for people. So I was like, oh, you movie star? Her mom's like, her picture's on the box. <laughs> I looked down at the box. Her picture was on the box. <laughs> I'd never seen this before. I freaked out. <laughs> then I got a little competitive. I was like, well, the only reason I ask is I'm actually a movie star. <laughs> I don't know what movies you've seen at your young age, little Janie, but I bet you saw one called Pootie Tang. <laughs> You remember the guy in the car? You're talking to him. What about the wrestler? Did you see that one, little Jenny? Yeah. I got to go to the Venice Film Festival for the premiere, huh? I mean, they made me pay my own way, but... When I got there, they let me watch a movie. Yeah, $3,300 flight. 700 for a tux, yeah, yeah. Anyway, give me a box of Samoas, make it out to top. Good to be back on stage at a real venue. Comics have been doing some weird gigs over this pandemic. Used to be you'd get a text from a comic and be like, hey, have you done that new club in St. Louis? Did they put you up in a nice hotel? Now it's like, have you done that fire escape show in Staten Island? <laughs> How many hand washing stations do that? <laughs> been tested for COVID like 38 times. At some point I realized it's something to do. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is an activity, isn't it? This should be in Time Out, New York's free stuff to do this week. <laughs> I'd hear about a testing site that had an hour wait. I'd be like, all right, that'll work. <laughs> so I can find one with a two hour wait. <laughs> Tried to make it a social event, called my friend Phil up. I go, Phil, let's go get tested together. It'd be great, we'll walk six feet apart, stand in line six feet apart. It'd be a great COVID hang. It's like, Todd, I don't need to get tested. I've been quarantining. And also, I need to go to the Apple store. <laughs> you can do both those? Reminds me of the time I was in solitary confinement and needed to go to Supercuts. <laughs> Went to get a COVID test, and they're said, I'm going to swab each nostril for 10 seconds. This is the way she counted. One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's <laughs> like, you know, I'm a busy guy, but I did block off the full 20 seconds. <laughs> Wasn't looking for express service on this. I'd hate to get stitches from you. I'm gonna give you 10 stitches. One, two, nine, ten. Get out of here. <laughs> I just freed up some time in your day to show off your gaping wounds. People got mad if you got the vaccine too soon. You hear these conversations, you get vaccinated yet? Yeah. Oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> oh, I have asthma. Oh, you have asthma. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> I'm saying I've known you for two hours. You've never mentioned that you have asthma. <laughs> got mine a little early, got my sticker saying I got vaccinated, posted on Instagram, thought people would be happy for me somewhere. Others are like, I want to know how you got that vaccine. <laughs> Then someone else would write in, yeah, I was about to ask him that myself. <laughs> then the third person would be like, you guys both beat me to the punch on this one. <laughs> How did he get that jab? <laughs> it's like, calm down, fellas. I'm about to post a screenshot of my medical records. <laughs> it is your business. Is really good about wearing my mask. Gotten a few actual altercations with anti-maskers. Cannot believe how brave I was. <laughs> I'd be at Bed Bath and Beyond and be like, hey you, I'm talking to you, 17-year-old stock clerk. <laughs> See the guy by the salad spinners? No mask, get him. <laughs> yeah, grab that set of carving knives. That's a big dude. You're a little guy and I'm headed for the exit. 
I'm not even gonna pay for these scrub daddies. I was in Burlington, Vermont, got into a taxi, and I saw the driver didn't have a mask on. I said, do you have a mask you can put on? He's like, I do, but you're not gonna like it. I was like, oh yeah, I think I am gonna like it. Please pull out the hilarious novelty mask. This guy pulls out a mask and says, Biden is as useless as this mask. Oh, you got him. (laughs) Powerful stuff. (laughs) He's going to be sad if he ever reads that, if he's straddling your rearview mirror. (laughs) Then the guy said, this new variant, it's just bronchitis. That's what my doctor told me. Oh, was your doctor adjusting your back while he told you that? Subtle chiropractic reference. (laughs) Always brings the house down. (laughs) Good year for doctors to be on TV. Sanjay Gupta, oh my God, they put that guy to work. Especially early on the pandemic, he'd be on CNN like, hi everyone, I'm Sanjay Gupta, I'm a neurosurgeon. And today I'm gonna teach you how to sanitize a Nutri-Grain bar. (laughs) I repeat, I'm a neurosurgeon. (laughs) I do brain surgery. I could be doing brain surgery right now. In fact, someone isn't getting brain surgery. (laughs) Because I'm standing here with a tub of Clorox wipes about to teach you how to do something you don't actually need to do. (laughs) But more on that in eight months. (laughs) Had to learn how to cook during the pandemic, went on TikTok for recipes. Every recipe on TikTok is (laughs) speed-oriented. Like, do you want to make a 25-second breakfast? (laughs) Start the clock. I started to embrace the idea of cooking, but then there's always that ingredient deal breaker. I'd be watching the chef on the screen, and I'd go, come on, man. You think I have rice vinegar? (laughs) You know I don't have rice vinegar. (laughs) Look at me, you know I don't have it. (laughs) Three people in the world have rice vinegar. (laughs) You and your two roommates. Realized how lazy I was about cooking. I'd read the directions on a microwave burrito. I'd be like, heat on high for one minute, then flip over. (laughs) I didn't go to Le Cordon Bleu Culinary Academy. I'm gonna see if I can slam this out in one step. No basting. Glad we're eating out again. I've had some great exchanges with waiters and waitresses over the years. This is an actual exchange I had with a waiter at an Italian restaurant in New York City not too long ago. Hi, is it possible to get a decaf espresso? You're the worst. (laughs) Okay. I don't mean to be all lawyerly, but that was a yes or no question. (laughs) But if you want to go with you're the worst, that works fine. Anyway, give me a decaf espresso with a big spoon of ketchup in it. Now I'm really bad. I was in a diner in Oklahoma. I ordered a salad, and she goes, what kind of dressing? I said, Italian. She leaned in and whispered something to me, but I didn't understand her. I go, what's that? She goes like, it's not good. What's not good? The Italian dressing. It's not good. It's not good. What's not good about it? It's not that tangy. Maybe you and I have different standards for tangy. Which dressing should I get? (laughs) I'd go with Thousand Island. I don't like Thousand Island. (laughs) 
I'll have the Italian. <laughs> Are you sure it's not good? <laughs> what part of it's not good, don't you understand? <laughs> We'll end that one right there. <laughs> there was like four points I could have gotten out of that joke and I just kept going. I felt so comfortable with you guys. I'm gonna be talking about race. And I never used to have to do that when I came on stage. But over the last couple of years, people get very sensitive if you bring up the issue of race or racism or racial rhetoric. You have people like Lawrence Fox who say stuff like, you know what, maybe if we stop talking about it, it would go away. When has that ever worked for any social ill or personal ailment you've ever had? If you went to a doctor and was like, there's a rash on my genitals, and he said, ignore that shit. You would say, I'd like another doctor, please. I also notice people always say, oh, here we go, you liberals, always whining. First of all, I'm not liberal, I will kick your mum in the face. <laughs> if you're racist. Second of all, uh, how can you be called a snowflake if you're liberal or care about other people? Like, when you think about the nature of a snowflake, you can't describe me in that way. Like, what's a snowflake? Individual, white and cold as fuck, <laughs> and tend to disappear in warm climates when black people are having a good time. <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth. But mainly when I try to talk about issues that affect this society where race is concerned, people say, oh, you seem very angry. You must have a chip on your shoulder. And I thought a lot about this chip on my shoulder. And in this world of body positivity, when we're embracing all of our curves and our flaws, I embrace having a chip on my shoulder as a black man in a racist society. Keeps me alert, keeps me alive, keeps me working for a better world. And I must share this lovely chocolate chip of mine with you guys. So I hope you're ready for some lovely social commentary cookies. <laughs> now, I'm calling them social commentary cookies, yes. I could call them home truths, but that tends to put people off when you tell them the truth. You know why? Because normally you go on a website and at the beginning it doesn't say, hey, we're gonna put a piece of coding into your computer so we can monitor all of your browsing activity and sell your data to other houses and maybe, you know, Keep that for ourselves, because we'd go, oh, I don't consent to this, that's kind of invasive. No, thank you. So instead, you go on websites and they go, hey, you like cookies? And we go, yeah, we love cookies. Give me some cookies now. <laughs> so I wanted to brace you for that. Because I get called an angry person all the time. I don't think I'm angry all the time. Just certain situations will bring out anger in anybody. Now, I know it's a comedy show and I don't want to start on a solemn tone, but I've got to tell you what happened. Um, I was attacked last week. And you don't expect to be attacked in the place you've grown up your whole life. There I was, around the corner from my own mother's house. And she lives in a leafy suburb. I did not expect this to happen. But something or someone hits the back of my head. And before I could think, I've got a warm, wet liquid trickling down the back of my neck. And I thought, please don't be what I think it is. But there we were, a pigeon shit on me. <laughs> Has this ever happened to anybody else? Yeah, it's not a nice thing to happen. But was it made worse when somebody went, don't worry, that's good luck. <laughs> I'm sorry, when did feces and fortune become bedfellows? There's nothing lucky about shit. In fact, shit is the opposite of luck. When you're not lucky, you go, oh shit. Now, we can test this theory. Anyone here ever bought a lottery ticket or a scratch card? Yeah, hoping to be lucky. Yeah, but you didn't wipe your bum with it before the numbers came out. Cause there's nothing lucky about shit. Nothing lucky about being shat on. Now, I wanna make sure we've made the distinction between the words shit and shat because those carry two very different meanings. Because if someone says to you, hey, I shit in your house, you'd be like, okay, bit too much information. You can just say you're going to the toilet. Anyway, that's fine. I hope you've washed your hands. But if someone says, hey, I shat in your house, there's a feeling that's still there. 
Now you gotta buy a new rug. <laughs> and get some new friends. So anyway, this pigeon shit on me. I was pissed off. And I decided to declare war on this pigeon and all of his kind. But then I thought, what a hypocrite. You can't blame an entire group or community for the actions of an individual. I'm not Liam Neeson or a Metropolitan Police Officer. So, can't do that. So, I thought the best thing to do would be to empathize and think about myself as a pigeon. And when I thought about it, you know what? Pigeons have a rough time in our society. Some of you might remember that pigeons used to exchange messages during the war. You know, when people ate licorice still. And they would exchange messages between the allies, helping us to defeat the Nazis. I say defeat, making a move to America. But the point is that pigeons helped out. Now, pigeons live like war veterans. They got limbs missing, no access to healthcare. They're homeless, congregating under bridges. It's tough when you're a pigeon. Not only that, when you're a pigeon, you're considered a second-class citizen to your white counterpart, the dove. <laughs> Did you even know that doves are just white pigeons? And they get all the good songs, all for the wings of a dove, when doves cry. There's no good pigeon songs. <laughs> Black people are like, there's one pigeon song. It's not positive. <laughs> and speaking from personal experience, when you've contributed to the infrastructure of a society and that society turns around and neglects your efforts, sometimes you gotta do wild shit so people pay attention. Maybe that's why that pigeon shouted me. And then when he went back to the Black Birds Matter rallies, they had a conversation about it. Because I assume all the black birds kind of get together. One of the more radical birds takes the stage. We'll call him Falcon X. And no one else is doing bird pan-Africanist pun. Shut up. So anyway, Falcon X comes on stage and he's like, this is some bullshit, I'ma keep shitting on them until they stop eating our eggs. Then one of the more moderate pigeons will call him Martin Koo, thinking he... <laughs> he's like, not all human beings are bad. Sometimes when you go to the park, they will give you breadcrumbs. And he's like, they also take breadcrumbs and they roll our legs in that and they fucking eat it. What are you talking about, mine? <laughs> like, even the fact that we call pigeons flying rats which is a derogatory term only to the black urban pigeons, mind you. Because when it comes to rats, there's also iniquity there. When you're a white rat, I'm not saying your life is perfect, but it could be worse. You get to work in a lab, free cosmetics, <laughs> healthcare, <laughs> exercise in a maze. When you're a black rat, what do you get? Blame for the plague? Or if you're a brown rat, you gotta do youth work in a sewer, teaching turtles kung fu and shit. That's no kind of life. Doesn't just happen on land either. This shit is taking place in the sea too. Some of you will be familiar with the species Orcus orca, known in documentaries as the black fish, but more commonly known as a killer whale. All these fish in the sea and the predominantly black one is called a killer. Is that fair? Why can't they be called sea pandas? I'm just saying that killer whales look more like pandas than sea lions look like lions. Like think about how we revere and look at lions. King of the savannah plains. Even lion kings. There's no sea lion king. Cause it don't look like a fucking lion. Can you imagine the first time a kid was told they was gonna meet an underwater lion? How disappointing that would have been. <laughs> Marine biologist comes home, he's like, hey there, son. I know I haven't been around as much as I should have been, but daddy's got a surprise for you. We finally discovered a new species, a sea lion, son. Dad, are you fucking serious? You guys have discovered a motherfucking sea lion? I don't really care for your language, son, but yeah, that's... <laughs> My fault for not being there, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, son, that's what happens. So now they get down to the lab and he's like, behold, son, in all of nature's majesty, a sea lion. Kid's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it's a sea lion, son. It's an otter with a fucking wax. You should have called it a sea badger. Don't you get tired of disappointing me, motherfucker? <laughs> Meanwhile, the biggest killer in the sea gets to enjoy the name Great White Shark. 
and all we do is talk about its greatness and its whiteness. Should be called a colonial fish, if you ask me. Out here just taking over. So when David Attenborough's on Blue Planet, he's like, since ancient times, the great white shark has been one of history's greatest hunters and most efficient killers. But we want to know, what's its secret? Oh, I know. Privilege! <laughs> Now you can tell me guys, did that seem kind of angry? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Well, that's fine. Some of you say yes, yeah, some of you say no. Well, I'll put that down to the fact that rarely do black people in our community get to explore the entirety of our emotional spectrum. It's not just from zero to anger all the time. There's a sliding scale. Also, just because we raise our voices doesn't mean we're angry. If you learn nothing else today, moving forward, Think of black shouting the same way you think about white women's tears. In that sometimes when we do it, we're in a good mood. And also sometimes it's the only recourse of action you have for people to pay attention to your needs. And finally, black people and white women telling us to calm down does not help. Yeah. So now you have that understanding, let me give you an idea of the sliding scale. We all get angry sometimes. And I don't go from zero to 10, it's a scale. So like one for me would be like, you know when you go into a room in the dark or you're not looking and you stub your toe on some furniture, but it's so painful, you're like, someone is trying to kill me in my own home. <laughs> Cause once I went into my nephew's bedroom, he had a Buzz Lightyear on the floor, I stepped on it and I was so angry. I was like, I wish this was Toy Story and you could come to life. Cause I'll fucking kill you, Buzz. <laughs> right, to show you halfway up the scale, I have a condition called misphonia. It means certain sounds make me very sensitive, like snoring or loud chewing. And I'm telling you this because I had to move out of my housemate's flat. I was living with a housemate, I had to find my own flat because this guy would make so much noise when he was eating because he refused to go to the dentist. I would fantasize about slitting his throat so he could bleed out all over the table. Now, be honest with me guys, does that seem kind of dramatic? Some say yeah, some say no. To those of you that say yeah, let me ask you a question. Who the fuck chews soup? <laughs> My housemate, that's fucking who. Yeah. Now, I wanted to give you an idea of what makes me angry. And I'm imagining some of you are like, well, based on what he's saying, then racism must be level 10 for Dane. But you'd be incorrect. Most people of color can tell you we are so used to discrimination, it's become part of the atmosphere. It's something you have to consider in every activity you do. Anything you do, you gotta think about how it's gonna affect you as a person of color in Western civilization. So I would say no, racism is not a 10 for me, it's more like an eight or a nine. 10 for me would be people still denying that racism exists. And those people are still out there. And some of them are black and brown people too, trying to find work and avoid getting shape-ups at barbershops. The point is, <laughs> thank you black people that got that. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, can we still deny the existence of racism in a post camera phone society, in a world where there are two men called Rage Charles and Stevie Wonder, who between both those guys have written at least three songs about racism. So if a blind man can see it, it must really exist. Some of you like, but my brown friend says, your brown friend can't play the piano with his fucking eyes closed. So I know that the conversation about privilege is a hard one to have because you live in a capitalist society where you're told you've got to work for everything, be a part of this rap race, and for you to win, someone lazier than you has to lose. You've all got the same 24 hours. Aww. Right, to get out there and do some work. So if it's gonna ease this conversation somewhat, I am now on stage prepared to discuss some aspects of black privilege. Would you like that? Yeah. Well, it don't fucking exist. How dare you? You're a shy lady, I laid the trap, you sprung it. Did you see that shit? <laughs> Sorry, mysterious racist in the shadows. I'll set you up there. Uh... <laughs> Whoa. Uh -huh. Yeah. Lighten up, everybody. The old room's here. Miniature golf, pitch and putt, par three. This
this madness has to end. We have to stop puttering around and drive towards closing this wedge. It's not a trap and it's not rough. It's easy and it's the fairway. You cannot petition a ball that's landed in the water. The fish don't have to die. Anyone can wear a green jacket. I'm talking about love, love, love. Come on, people now. Smile on your putter. Everybody get together and learn to live in a clown's nose right now. The man's going to come along and he's going to try to take away all your childlike qualities and steal all your hope. Miniature golf didn't have to grow up. You didn't have to take away the windmills and the zigzags and the railings. You didn't have to make it tedious and boring. It used to be fun. You moved the headstones, but you never moved the bodies, did you? There used to be a clothesline with a blanket over it, and you'd stand there with your little fishing pole, and then you'd take your string line and you'd drop it over, and Grandma would tape a fish to the end of it. That used to be sports fishing, but you made that grow up too. Now it's suffocate that bastard with an inch of his life, throw it back in, and grandma spit it in her grave. Yeah. Oh, the IRS, second mortgages, high interest rates, credit card debts, the 1%. What's my point? What's my point? My point is I meant to come out and say, hi, how are you guys doing tonight? They think I'm getting booed. <laughs> hey, did you ever uh, see a carpenter get really angry and have a hissy fit? No. It's called the hammer throw. What is this guy? I feel sorry for this guy. What does he do when the Olympics just passed him by? Oh, look at me. I can throw the hammer further than anybody, but I'm living in poverty. There's no hammer capades. There's no pro hammer tour. There's no hammer throw on ice. This guy's fucked. But you know what? Two days out of every four years, he's the king of the world. What does he care? There's guys on TV playing cards and he's on food stamps. He doesn't care. And that's not even what I wanted to talk about because the, the crime rate in the synchronized swimming community is skyrocketing. What are they going to do after the Olympics? You know, uh, uh, maybe get a gig at Dolphin World or maybe get a gig in a fountain in front of a Vegas hotel living half their life below sea level. It's just terrible. Let me tell you something. I saw a woman on the street and she had on a swimsuit, a uh, swim cap and a nose plug and an open guitar case. She went on her back with her legs in the air and she was furiously kicking them in a rhythmic fashion, but just furiously kicking away, boy. Oh, it made me sad. I gave her a dollar. I went to an Indian casino and I went there to take back what they've been taking back, what we took in the first place, but now they're way ahead. Oh, but they tricked me again. Oh, sure, man. They raking it in. And I don't even know why I go because they're just like the Vegas casinos, you know? I expect these, uh, I expect these casinos to be a little more tribal, you know? I don't know, like their pit bosses to be dressed in some sort of uh, pit boss shaman skin, you know? And, uh, well, you're sitting there, you're playing blackjack boy, and uh, you got a nine and a five, and the dealer's showing a seven. You don't know what to do, stand pat or take a hit. And you look at the pit boss shaman, and he starts to go into a trance. Now he starts chanting, hey, hey, quack, hey. And then he hands you a petrified wooden ladle made by the ancient ones. And you drink from a, the boiling mushroom concoction. And now suddenly you're out running with the elk and deer. Shit, you are an elk and deer. And you're out there running around in a crystal redwood forest. And then you turn into a centaur. And now you're running around in your centaur. And then you replace Robert Goulet in the National Touring Show of Camelot. And then you look below your hooves and the emerald green field gives way to a swirling hot light and you see the woman that you love you look right into her eyes and she reaches into the void and pulls you out of the pit of nothingness and then you kiss and a strong wind blows and turns you both into sand and then suddenly you're back in your chair covered in sweat and you yell out hit me <laughs> you get a seven that's 21 Dealer flips a nine, that's 16, he pulls a 10, 26, busted! And as the chill's still tingling up your spine, the pit boss shaman leans in and says two words, breakfast comped. <laughs> You gotta 
take care of yourself, boy. That's why I've been enduring all these years. Just the little things, really. Uh, for instance, breakfast time. I don't butter my cheesecake anymore. And I went and got a Nutribullet. These things are small. Very lovely item. I keep mine in my pants. So I've got mine in my pants so I can come over to your house and go into your kitchen and sit on your counter because it's small enough to use every day. Are you going to want to enjoy that? Of course you are. Now, how's that for convenience? Now, what if we took Einstein's theory of relativity, made that small enough to fit on your countertop? Do you think you'd want to use that every day? I think you would. You've got Eagles MC Square and you've got a strange man with a neutral in his pants. You're out there. You're traveling the speed of light. You're going back and forth. And every time you come back, all your friends are dead. And you're enjoying delicious smoothies out of a strange man's pants. Now, how much would you pay for all that? But you know what, it's, it's convenient, you know, and it is healthy, but I really, you know, they had this guy on a long time ago, and my favorite infomercial of all time, they had this guy on the Juice Man Juicer, and uh, yeah, boy, he was one intense little fella. You know, he, uh, he was old. I figured back then he was probably pushing 116, 117, and you know, he had a gray skin, very leathery, very tan, and he had silver hair slicked back, and he had lightning bolts for eyebrows, boy, and he's kind of bug-eyed, really intense. You know, and I said, shit, I got to order this thing. You know, it's late at night. I'm a little high and he's bug-eyed. I got to take it or otherwise he'll just kill me with his lightning bolts. And two weeks go by, I don't get anything, man. I don't get the juice man juicer. And then one morning I'm laying in bed. I get a weird feeling there's somebody else in the room. You've had that feeling before. Then I bolt upright in bed and whoa, they're on the corner was the juice man. They screwed up, man. Instead of sending me the juice man juicer, they sent me him. Get up, Rube. I got a good one. Oh, first of all, thanks for buying the product. Anyhow, this is a great way to start your day. We got apple, carrot, parsley, and a circus peanut. Because you can't just eat the uh, fleshy center of that orange treat. You got to eat the peanut skin, boy, because that's where all the phytonutrients are that feed the trillions of living cells. Look at me. I'm in the same shape I was when I blew fight for the Revolutionary War. Oh, yeah, start juicing. You're going to see the energy. You're going to see the difference. You're going to see the healing. You're going to see brightly colored spinning po soccer balls popping out, out of nowhere. Yes, sir, boy. Hey, here's a good one for street performers. A college degree you'll never use, crushed velvet, uh, parsley, and a puppet, because you can't just eat the fleshy puppet center. you got to juice the puppet skin, boy, because that's where the trillions of nutrients are. Live food, living cells, uh, living people, living food, uh, rock operas, diesel fuel. I am a very disturbed man, and I need help now. <laughs> This is a good one for you, Rube. I'm not bullshitting you here. This will really get you going. Cherry flavored dust of the bones of people who have lived before us. A box full of earlobes from the heads of young virgins. Parsley. And a 13 foot python, cause you can't just juice, you gotta ride the snake, baby. Juice man, you gotta go home. <laughs> I was in the hospital and they said, they said, uh, that's it, man, you're done drinking. They said, you and, and alcohol don't mix anymore. Aww. Yeah, they said, you can't have another drink as long as you live. And I just looked at them and said, don't tell me what to do, this is the gift shop. <laughs> But I went back to the doc. I went. I did go to see a doctor, and he said, oh, "He goes, uh, he goes, Bob, your levels are pretty high." And I said, "What? What are you? Are you kidding me, Doc? I was born a little bit high. What are you trying to tell me?" He said, "Well, your oligarchy levels are off the charts. Your feudal system is weak." I said, "Give it to me straight, Doc. What is it? Am I pan seared? Is there something wrong with my brain? What's going on?" And I told the doc, I said, look at me, I swear to God, I try to take care of myself, but it's impossible because they're tweaking the wheat. Oh, yeah, I gave up eating processed foods. I gave up my cheese foods. I gave up my bologna. I gave it all up, but it doesn't matter anymore because they're tweaking the wheat. 
It doesn't matter. It's not your grandparents' weed anymore, man. There's nothing you can do to be healthy because even when you try it, they'll get you because they're tweaking the wheat. It says in the Bible, Ezekiel, eat the Ezekiel bread. I, you know, because Ezekiel bread doesn't matter anymore because they're tweaking that wheat. They're tweaking the Bible bread. They're tweaking the Bible bread. I don't know. I don't know if it really said that in the Bible. I've never read a Bible. I did snort a line off of one once and. Uh, you know, sometimes just through the process of nosmosis, you just pick things up, you know, and, uh, and you know, it just, you, there's nothing you can do, man. They're tweaking the weed. It's not our grandparents' wheat. So they're tweaking the wheat. You can't get healthy. And now they're tweaking the dogs. That's right, man. They're tweaking the dogs. I sit out in front of a cafe and I see a dog walk by. And it's got knobs on it. And I'm not using a metaphor for some sort of low hanging genitals. No, no, I'm talking about like a fender amp dog, a dog you can turn up. And the lady's walking by with her dog acting like nothing's going on. And I'm like, am I losing my freaking mind? Because I don't get it. I don't get it. I know we live in a country that's the United States of ostriches and everybody's hiding in the sand, pretending that none of this is going on, but they're tweaking the wheat and they're tweaking the dogs and I couldn't take it anymore. And I stood up and I yelled out, hey lady, there's knobs on your dog. And she just looked at me like I was trying to hit on her. <laughs> they're tweaking the wheat. But I still don't butter my cheesecake. I had a big birthday last year. Um, uh, I am born in October, Scorpio, and people have bad people have bad impressions of Scorpios. They say things like Scorpios are full of revenge and jealousy. They've been saying that to me since I was seven. <laughs> They're like, "You're wild in the sack." You're like, "Am I?" And then you just grow into it, you know? <laughs> but I'm tired of horoscope prejudice. I am tired of it. And one thing you can do is you can write, I wrote down an evil historical figure for all of the other 11 star signs. <laughs> so then when they give me guff, I can be like, oh, and you're, you're a Capricorn? Those are good. Uh, Kim Jong-un is a Capricorn. <laughs> so that's a good one. Good for you, way better than me. <laughs> What's your uh, horoscope, sir? Gemini. Gemini, right on. Let me see what we got here. <laughs> Gemini, ever heard of Jeffrey Dahmer? <laughs> Watch out for this guy. <laughs> How about you, sir? What's your star sign? Aries. Kim Jong-un's dad. <laughs> and Logan Paul. Ouch. That hurts. That one stings. Anybody feel like you have a perfect horoscope? I see a hand over here. Leo, known for seeking attention. <laughs> nice. First hand up, just like Hermione and Charms. Uh, Mussolini. Roman Polanski, watch out for her. <laughs> I saw another hand right behind her. Yeah, we're Leos too. Oh yeah, both, both the Leos. <laughs> Not one other hand in the room. <laughs> That's beautiful. Horoscopes, they're so real, right? They're kind of true if you like think about it. <laughs> something to it. Yeah, it's because people have been telling them they want attention since they're five years old. And they're like, oh, okay, I guess I do. We'll do one more.
Okay, how about you, sir? Aquarius. Aquarius? Rare, one in 12. <laughs> Very rare. Oh. Uh, Jeff Epstein. So, Watch out for that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't feel old, but I did recently identify a bird, and that doesn't seem good. Is that a whippoorwill? Why do I care? And why do I have binoculars? I got into bird watching over the pandemic, went down to Central Park. At first I did it ironically. I was like, I'm so alone. <laughs> Two hours later, I'm like, Martha, look at that owl. <laughs> Gorgeous. She's like, that's a robin. I'm like, I'm new. New kid on the block, but that is gorgeous. And I actually met a professional bird watcher. He gives birding tours, and I said, that sounds like a fun job. And he goes, well, you get a lot of egos. <laughs> In bird watching? And he explained that people will brag about how many birds they've identified in their career. And the best part is how they verify they've seen a bird is they just say that they did. <laughs> so I've seen every bird, prove I haven't. All 10,000. Oh yeah, where'd you see the cinnamon-breasted toady tyrant? Asheville. They only live in Tasmania. Yeah, I was surprised. I was like, weird, here? <laughs> Check. <laughs> but if you ever meet an arrogant birder, you could actually have more fun if you went too low with your number. If they're bragging, just be like, I I've only seen two. <laughs> well, you've seen more than two birds. I wish. <laughs> Yeah, it's just been pigeons and crows for me. It's super bad at it. How long have you been bird watching? Four years. I don't know if I'm looking in the wrong places or what. I've seen chicken nuggets, but that doesn't count. I don't know. I like what Pete is doing. They're trying to remove animal violence from figures of speech. They want us to stop saying kill two birds with one stone, and they want us to replace it with feed two birds with one scone. <laughs> and that's so sweet. And I could almost see it meaning sort of the same thing. And I want all of us to implement it immediately. The next chance you have, no explanation. Hey, while you're grabbing gas, could you grab some milk as well? Feed two birds with one scone. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just grab some milk with the gas, would you? <laughs> two birds, one scone. <clears throat> <laughs> but birds, a lot of them are gluten intolerant. So if you feed two birds, one scone, you could kill two birds with one scone. <laughs> yeah. The violence remains. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time in coffee shops. I know I didn't need to say that out loud to you, but I do. <laughs> and scones will get rock hard about two hours after they were fresh. So you could even kill two birds with one scone stone style as well. <laughs> There's more than one way to skin a cat. <laughs> I mean, pet a cat. More than one way to pet a cat, this way and that. 
tail and back. Whiskers. <laughs> you can kill a bunch of birds if you have one cat. Mm -hmm. You sure can. You sure can. I was just in uh, Arizona and somebody told me to go see the petroglyphs. I didn't know what those are. We get out there. They're these ancient rock drawings, and there's a plaque that says, unfortunately, there's no way to translate what these mean today. However, this little squiggle might be a snake, and you're like, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> and then they go, and this little circle might be a portal into another world. <laughs> wow, you really took some liberties on that one. No way to translate, but you're gonna guess portal <laughs> off of that. Okay. You're not gonna guess that they were drawing a circle or the sun? Portal, all right. And this lady, I didn't see her standing right behind me, and she goes, don't you wish we could take a time machine and ask them what they really meant? And I think that's why I don't love talking to strangers. <laughs> Because you have to be polite. You can't be honest and be like, actually, that would be a dumb reason to time travel. <laughs> Spend trillions of dollars on fuel. Hey, we're here from the future. Me and this lady, we were... <laughs> we were so curious about this rock doodle <laughs> that you did on this rock. Is that a snake? We're from the future. Uh, I was trying to draw a worm. It's a worm. Good thing we time traveled, Martha. Well, we're gonna head back to our time machine. Right through this circle. He's like, whoa. Cool portal. Wow, wrong about the snake, right about the portal. Didn't see that coming, Platt. <laughs> Didn't see it coming. Anytime time travel comes up, it's always a short walk to the baby Hitler paradox. Some of you familiar? It's the ethical debate. The ethical debate. Would it be better to, if you time traveled back to the moment Hitler was a baby, would it be better to kill baby Hitler or let him live? Classic ethical paradox. What would you do, sir? <laughs> it's Hitler. You can save a lot of people. Kill the baby. Kill the baby. You, you're going to kill the baby? Kill the baby. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's a fine answer. Now, you saved a lot of people. Uh, but it is a baby, and we do need to know how you would do it. You're a time-traveling assassin. You gotta kill this baby. How do you do it? Think about a time machine. I'd get a seat further back. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I don't understand why you wouldn't want to field this question, sir. <laughs> He's requested to move back further into the crowd, where we will still follow up on the, the question. No, it's cool. Uh, it's just a special. It's just a special. Uh, it's, just my, it's just my first ever one hour special. And. Yeah, so. Pretty much the fate of it rests on you now. <laughs> if you have a good answer, it's going to a big platform. <laughs> if you don't answer, it's going to Quibi. <laughs> uh, what would you do? Sorry, what's the question? How would you kill a baby? Gosh, it's not that complicated. If I was the time traveling assassin, I don't think I would 
be able to kill a baby. And that's fine if you would kill a baby. I just don't think <laughs> I would be able to. That's just me. But I do think I would panic and bring it back to the time machine, show up in the present. They're like, why do you have a baby? I'm like, it's Hitler. <laughs> Who's Hitler? I'm like, it worked. <laughs> and now I just have baby Hitler. <laughs> Is this why I never had kids? Was I meant to raise Hitler in the 21st century? <laughs> I would try so hard to teach him to love. Find out if it's nature or nurture once and for all. He grows up, goes off to art school. I'm like, I'm so proud of you, baby Hitler. I still call him that. <laughs> he calls me, he's like, I fell in love. I'm like, that away, baby. <laughs> love wins. I guess it is nurture over nature. A Couple years later, he's like, she dumped me for a rabbi. I hate Jews. I'm like, easy, hello. <laughs> Kanye was right. No, boy. <laughs> that is not what we teach in the Zimmerman household. <laughs> I'm actually not Jewish. A lot of people ask me if I'm Jewish because of my last name. Um, I'm not. And that is something I would mention to Hitler just as a precaution. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't grow up with uh, any real religion. It, my, my grandparents were super Christian, and my grandma, one of the first Christmases I can remember, she gave me one of the illustrated Bibles, all the greatest hits, you know the ones. <laughs> Adam and Eve, the origin story of food shaming. <laughs> I know when I eat apples, I'll smother them in peanut butter and honey. <laughs> And afterwards, sometimes I'm like, I need to put clothes on. That <laughs> was bad. That was naughty. I don't deserve happiness. But my favorite as a kid was always David and Goliath, because, you know, a little boy beats a giant. That's awesome. And looking back, that teaches a great lesson to kids, which is if your opponent is stronger than you, shoot them in the head. <laughs> from a safe distance when they were not expecting it. <laughs> Was that a fair fight, David, or a murder? I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure you can be the underdog if you're doing drive-bys. <laughs> What'd you learn on that one, Joey? I learned that ranged weapons always defeat melee. <laughs> Good. My wife and I don't want to have kids. We don't want to ruin our dog's life. So we want to, yes, yes. Dogs over people, yeah? All right. Fantastic. You got a dog? You went pretty nuts. Two? Right on. What kind of dogs? Beautiful. Nice. What do I have? Thanks for throwing it back. Uh, you're clearly not a grandmother. I had a 100-pound Mastiff that we had to put down during... I know I loved her, but she lost all my money in crypto. So I was like... You... No. No, she was sick. Putting a dog down is the worst. I don't know if anybody's had to do it. It's the worst thing in the world. Devastating. One of my buddies tried to make me feel better. He goes, at least it's not like a family member died. I was like, dude, there are so many humans in my family I would have rather put down than that dog. <laughs> yeah. I could think of two aunts and a dad I'd push in front of a bus for one more hour. One more game of fetch. We got a new one, though. We got a beautiful little yellow lab pit, beagle mix, some train wreck of a big dumb ears. I love her. I love her so much. Sometimes I think I love her more than I love my wife. <laughs> and I know my wife loves the dog way more than she loves me. Like it's, it's, like sex with my wife has just become foreplay for petting the dog now. <laughs> you dog owners know what I mean. 
the minute we're done, I'm like, bring me that dog, get her over here. Put her on my sweaty belly. I'm just dabbing sweat with her big ears. Just... Remember those old movies? They'd light a cigarette and look cool after sex. I'm just petting a puppy with a shaky hand. Like, bring us a Gatorade, my electrolytes are low. <laughs> I could pinpoint the moment that I realized I loved the dog a little bit more. My dog sleeps in between my wife and I, on her back, head level, sprawled out, comfortable, and she snores like a dying old alcoholic man. Like, it's like zombie sleep apnea. She, I've never heard noises like this. She's like, wah, eyes are open, like paws are going. I love it. I can't get enough. I'm laying on my pillow like, I gotta get this dog a TikTok. This is amazing. <laughs> and then my wife, my wife rolled over and made one little noise. She was just like <laughs> I'm just staring at her furious. Like if she doesn't, if she doesn't shut the hell up, I'm gonna ball up every dirty sock, cram it in her mouth. She's gonna wake the dog up. I like put my beats on the dog playing tranquil music. I'm like, you guys have those like obnoxiously named overpriced doggy daycare places around here? Those dumb names. Do you guys have any? Yeah. Yell them out. What's the names of the places? Dogtopia. I was in Boulder, Colorado. They had one called Bonjour. And it's like. I bring my dog to a place, 50 bucks to bring her to hang out for the day. And then they text me like they, to guilt me into buying add-ons for her. They send me a picture of her, she's all sad. The other dogs are in the back like fucking and drinking and smoking cigarettes. My dog. Like... <laughs> dog's doing a keg stand. They text me, for $15, you could get your dog a compassionate CBD paw rub. I'm like, can you just make sure she doesn't eat shit? That's like really all we want. She doesn't need 12 minutes in the heated pool with a snuffle pad. Just please keep her out of traffic. That's all we want. We get pictures of her with like a unicorn horn sucking on a glow stick. I'm like, you give her ecstasy? Like, what is this? Is Burning Paw today at Bark Avenue? <laughs> I know my neighbors by their dog's names. Like, I don't know my neighbors. You guys know what I mean? I'm like, I'm like, oh, there's Maggie and the asshole that walks her. I hate that guy. He never says anything good. <laughs> she's a good pup and I got a great wife 10 years married to my wife she's a nurse practitioner fought the good fight for all of us yeah. amazing woman boy I'll tell you everyone was so great to the nurses during the pandemic man you guys were awesome we were in New York and everybody was standing on their stoops banging pots and pans calling her a hero. We appreciated it. I booed her every night when she got home. I, uh, I just wanted to keep her honest. You know what I mean? Like, you guys build her up. I got to keep her sharp for us, you know? I don't need her peacocking around the kitchen all tits forward, you know? I got to make sure she's tight. She'd come home after a long shift. She'd be like, we saved 31 people today. And I'm like, I read 4,000 died. So I don't know, babe. <laughs> like, you may want to keep those scrubs handy, pumpkin. I, uh, I don't hear no bell, Mick. 
I didn't say that. I sprayed her in the face with Lysol and hid under the kitchen table like a <laughs> giant baby. Lighting matches, trying to land them in her Crocs. Make noise if you're a nurse. Where are you? Nurses in here? Yeah, anybody? Oh, yeah? Fantastic. Is this your guy? What do you do, sir? <laughs> Don't ruin my fucking special. <laughs> I'm just going to insert a thing, so. I drive a truck. Okay, <laughs> truck driver. We got that? I wish every day was a special. You just make shit up. So she's a little smarter than you. Yeah. I hear you, bro. I'm picking up what you're putting down. My wife's getting smarter and smarter right in front of me, and I'm not. I'm not. She's a cancer surgeon's nurse practitioner. Yeah. And I sit at home and watch cartoons and listen to The Grateful Dead. Yeah, it's important, but... I just, I'm not keeping up with the conversations. Like, I'm, she tells me shit about work, and I'm like, can you call someone you work with? Like, she tells, she tells me stories. Like, she thought I was like, I was there handing her a scalpel all day. I'm like, you remember when I wasn't there the whole time? Like, I just throw things I heard on commercials back at her to keep up. I'm like, how was your day? She's like, oh, we had to palpate the sutures on a Whipple. And I'm like, that sounds moderate to severe right there. I think that's... That is textbook plaque psoriasis, if I have ever heard. They should ask their doctor or pharmacist if AstraZeneca can help. They might lower their copay. I'm hypochondriac, I have everything. I have everything. I die of 10 things a day. Everything her patients have, I have. Like I hear the word and I'm like, yeah, I'll die from that, totally. I had pancreatitis the other day. She said the word and I'm like, yeah, I'll die, totally, that'll kill me. I just started holding my back. Like I just was in the middle of her story. I'm like, oh yeah, shit, that's... It's no joke, that pancreatitis. <laughs> she goes, that's not even where your pancreas is. And I'm like, oh, it's radiating, okay? It's clearly advanced and it's probably in the lymphatic region now, so... You should give me some Advil. And... I feel bad for her, I'm not easy. It's a great part of a relationship when you can show each other your messed up shit. You know what I mean? You guys, I hope you're in a relationship because he's had your knee pretty locked down for... Are you at that point, say you're watching TV and you got some weird thing on your foot, can you like dangle it in her face and be like, is that cancer, babe? Is that... Can you feel this lump? That's true love. I show my wife everything, everything. And I couldn't show her things during the pandemic. Cause she was like in the COVID, like full beekeeper, like the whole nine yards, you know? So we had to, she was in one bedroom, I was in the other and I couldn't show her thing. I was, she's saving lives and I'm an out of work comic at home with crippling anxiety and Google. Bad combination. My Google searches before the pandemic were unbelievable. I was like, can I smoke Molly, Google? Then the pandemic starts. I'm like, one hand is warmer than the other, Google. What, what variant is this? Do I rub elderberry on it or is it too late? I didn't know what to do. I don't know if you guys remember, but early on in the pandemic, they said like exercise, keep your lungs healthy in it and you won't get COVID. Remember that crap? That's, that fake news was brought to us by Big Peloton, I think. <laughs> I bought an exercise bike the minute I heard that. I put it in the house against the wall and I pedaled it like it was Wizard of Oz. Like I was stealing purses in the 1940s. I'm just like. I 
I wrote it so hard, I gave myself a hemorrhoid. This was the... That's how I started the pandemic. Young guys in here, do you even know what a hemorrhoid is? Oh. Kiddos, listen, it's the worst. It's like a purple Advil grows out of your asshole. And it feels like 90,000 bees are stinging you all at once right on your ass. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is how I die. My ass is going to eat me from the bottom up and I can't even go to the hospital. It's COVID. Just panicking, pacing, Googling. I couldn't show my wife. Normally I would have shown her. I just would have woken her up from a nap and been like, babe, is this for just grandfather clocking her? Bing bong. Bing bong. Hit snooze. You're like, is that normal? <laughs> so I text her and I go, I think my asshole's trying to kill me. And she goes, send me a video of it. She goes, send me a video of it. I never even sent her a picture of, like, I, now I gotta send her an, an asshole movie? Like, I gotta. Why'd she skip over pictures? It took me nine takes. I have like eight, I have like director's cut, DVD, like commentary, Blu-ray. I put the phone on the toilet seat and like entered the room like, oh, oh, I didn't see you there. Like, it's like presenting, like it was like Animal Planet moving stuff out of the way. <laughs> One video was just all ceiling. I don't even know how I wasn't in it. I was like, how the hell? <laughs> just all cheek and hair. I was putting like sepia tones in the dog ears on Instagram. And finally I got a good one. I was like, Mwah! I'm sending this to a film festival. I sent it to her, and the minute I hit send, I'm like, I can never leave this woman. This is it. She's got a video of my asshole at its worst. I mean, like, that's a vow. That's the ring we should give each other when we get married. It's a picture of our assholes at its worst. I guarantee the divorce rate will drop if we do that. I'm Sean McLaughlin. It's, uh, it is really good to be here. I mean, look, just to let you know straight off the bat, I'm not gonna do any of the heavy shit tonight, okay? Like we've, we've had a lot of bad years in this country. The last couple of years, we've lost a lot. I'm not going to talk about any of that because, frankly, I don't think comedians should be talking about it. I'm not ready to laugh yet. Okay? I'm not ready. We've lost a lot in this country. We've lost a top shock. Gone. All right. <laughs> Debenhams. Gone. <laughs> yet somehow, against all odds, W. H. Smith hangs in there. I mean. <laughs> What is the fucking hold-up on this bankruptcy? <laughs> what needs to happen for this cockroach to die? <laughs> it's the worst shop in Britain, isn't it, WH Smith? It's got to be the worst shop in Britain. I don't know about you, I only go in there if I need a private place to fart. Right, I hate it. <laughs> hate WH Smith, I hate everything about it. Hate the colour scheme, it's all blue, it's like you're being waterboarded. <laughs> I hate the staff, they're all ugly. Can we admit this? They're all ugly, so something's going on. Sorry. Oh, fuck, I've forgotten a bit already. Um, um, does anyone here work for WH Smith? Anyone... Stand up comedy, can I just say, it really is as hard as I make it look. I hope you appreciate that. It really is. No, it is good to be here. 15 years I've been a comedian this year. 15 years. It's my big tour to celebrate 15 years as a comedian. 15 years. And you, I, I'm proud of that. I am proud of that. Do you know what I'm most proud of? I never sold out. I'm proud of that. I never sold out. I don't even mean artistically. I've literally never sold out a gig in my life. And I don't plan to because I'm not a corporate shill like your other comedians. I stick it to the mat. I don't let them get to me. I don't. Like, for example, this bucket. Now, I brought a bucket on stage. That's pretty unusual for a comedian. 
But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Just, you just say, oh, you've got one. There's a fuck it. Just to let you know, if you're watching at home, there are meth heads in the audience. <laughs> Lower your expectations accordingly. Listen, because I stick it to the man. I don't let the man in. I don't know. I don't, I don't even use the internet. I don't, I don't let the big tech companies know me. Like, they think they know me. Google, they think they know me. You know, they know all of you. They've got profiles of everyone in this room based on what you type in, but Google don't know me. Because what they don't realise is I spend an hour every morning feeding them false information about myself. <laughs> it's the only way to win in this life. Every time I have a genuine question I need to ask Google, I ask five buffer questions <laughs> I have absolutely no interest in just to put those sluts off the set, right? <laughs> It's not an easy life, but I do it. I do it for you. I sit down in the morning, uh, whereabouts in France was Napoleon born? <laughs> Can you visit Napoleon's childhood home on Corsica? <laughs> Vegetarian restaurants near Napoleon's childhood home. <laughs> then I get down to it, then I get down to it. Do turtles come? <laughs> Images. It's the only way. To stick it to the man. And you've got to stick it to the man in life. You've got to stick it. And Google are the man. Make no mistake. Google are the man. Here's how I view it. If Google was a bloke, he would be in prison. If Google wasn't a faceless corporation, if it was Nigel Google down the bar, we. <laughs> Finishing all your sentences for you. <laughs> Taking pictures of your house from space. <laughs> Fuck off, Nigel. How are you getting away with this? You don't even pay your taxes, man. I suppose my main, my main thing about Google is I, they're just so American. Do you know what I mean? They're like the ultimate American company. Because nothing's ever enough for America. And nothing's ever enough for Google. I mean, my God, they still advertise. <laughs> Think about that. Google still advertise. What is your problem, Google? <laughs> Who has slipped through the net? <laughs> Who is watching an advert for Google today going, Google? <laughs> Go Jeeves, is this true? <laughs> They're relentless. I see adverts for Google every day of my life. I see an advert for Google. I saw one this morning. I was on YouTube. I was watching this turtle thing. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. <laughs> and before the video, there was an advert for Google, which is very surreal because Google owned YouTube. I don't know if you know that, but Google owned YouTube. So it's very surreal. And then they go, hey, go on Google. It's like, I'm fucking hit. I'm on it. <laughs> How much more can I give you? How much more of me are you going to take? You do it all. You do my email, you do my calendar, you take me around town, you've got photos of my knob. How much more do you want? <laughs> but that's America. That's America. Nothing's ever enough for America. Nothing. There is an American flag on the moon. There is an American flag on the moon. I mean, if there's one thing in life that can't be claimed, surely it's the moon, but no, the moon's American. Makes sense, of course the moon's American. It's white, it's round. <laughs> it's inexplicably involved in women's reproductive organs. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Nothing against Americans, by the way. If you've got any Americans in, I don't know if we do. Nothing against Americans. I love Americans. I love, how could I hate Americans? My wife is Canadian. So there you go. <laughs> And Americans and Canadians are the same, as you know, they're the same. Oh, they are. And anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you maple syrup, all right? <laughs> I am married though, that's true, I'm married, very happily married, very happily married. That might be a surprise. Yeah, might be a surprise to some of you. I do give off what one police officer described as an extremely divorced energy. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I love her. I fucking love my wife so much. I love, this is stand-up comedy. I don't want to get too cornball. Genuinely, I'm, I'm going to be sad when she leaves me. Like, <laughs> which she must, she must. Not because I'm a bad husband, but my wife is, is better than me. 
And if you're better than someone, you leave them. Do you agree with that? Hard no for the people of, that there's a lot of wives and girlfriends in the room going, what, was that an option? Yeah, it was. I don't think that's a controversial statement. If, you know, if you're better than someone, you leave them. I've had ex-girlfriends in the past. They left me, they were better than me. My last girlfriend before I, I met my wife, I left, I was, I was better than her. No, I, I, no, I, it's really hard to talk about people in that way, but she's the worst person who ever lived. I am better than that. Like, <laughs> Like, I would describe my ex-girlfriend sort of morally, I would say she was Saddam Hussein, but if he really leaned into it. Like, if he really... <laughs> like, she used to say this a lot. She used to say, she used to say, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Which, first of all, uh-oh, twat alert, missed, the word, missed it. That's such a shit phrase. I never got that phrase. If you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Because your worst and your best are linked. They're li no one's that... No one's that complicated, you know? No one's... We're all pretty simple at the end of the... You know, no one's kicking puppies on a Tuesday, curing cancer on a Wednesday. You're all pretty... <laughs> my my ex-girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, at her worst, at her worst, she would get aggressively drunk, she'd hurl abuse at my friends and family, She'd lower my self-esteem, I would say, systematically, so I was scared to leave the relationship. Yeah. At her best, she wouldn't. So... <laughs> so, so I left. As my wife must leave me. And I, I love my wife. I want to be good enough for my wife, but she deserves the best. And I'm not the best. She deserves a husband to be proud of. A husband to go, look, look at my husband. Look at those teeth, my God. You know, his laptop case isn't just a pizza box. <laughs> Instead, what has she got? This is my husband. He's an unknown comedian. He used a debit card to cut my birthday cake. <laughs> Four years ago, he accidentally took ecstasy because he thought it was ibuprofen. <laughs> That's not even a fucking joke, right? <laughs> I'll tell you the story. We'd had a couple friends round. There was a bit of a mix-up. I double-dropped pills at 9.30 on a Sunday morning. Do you have any idea? I came up in home base. I was with my wife. She was like, are you OK? I was like, you have got to feel this gravel, baby. <laughs> That's where I got the bucket. Anyway. Canada. Canada. Very appealing country, isn't it, Canada? Very appealing country, very romantic. I think I might move over there, that's the truth. I think I might move over there. I am thinking of it. It's a great country. Do you know what? Because they got standards over there. They got standards in Canada. Like, I flew out of Ottawa International Airport a couple of Christmases ago. It was minus 30 degrees. Minus 30. And the planes were taking off. <laughs> And the schools were open, and nothing was... If it got to minus 30 in this country, do you think the airports would still be fucking open? If it got to minus 30 in this country, the Prime Minister would go on the news to legalise cannibalism. Okay? <laughs> minus 30 degrees, and the planes were taken off. I was on a train in the Midlands last week that got cancelled because there was Dairy Lee on the tracks, OK? <laughs> We're losing our standards in this country. This used to be a great country, we're losing our way. I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. We need to be more like the French. Do you agree with that? Yes. No one ever says yes. No one... I did this show in Paris last month, even though they were like, I don't know, man. I, don't know. I genuinely love the French. I love that everything I've ever wanted to be is a French person. I say that sincerely with all my heart. They're thoughtful. Mm. <laughs> They're philosophical. Oh. They drink red wine to numb the gonorrhea, ooh la la. <laughs> and as soon as things get even a little bit difficult, they just fucking quit. I mean, God, don't you wish you had that in your locker as an English person? And I'm not saying that to be cheap, by the way. The French are rebels, they're revolutionaries. It's in their blood, it's in their history. We don't know how to quit. We don't know how to quit. I hear English people say this a lot. I've never quit anything in my life. People say that here. I've never quit anything in my life. They say it like it isn't the most psychopathic thing that a human being can say. 
You never quit anything. I've never quit anything. I finished every meal I've ever started. I've still got all my shares at Woolworths. God save the king. <laughs> I'm intimidated by the French. I'm intimidated by how good they are at quitting. Like, that's why I never get it when people always say, French quit the Second World War. Yeah. It was shit. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always work, that one, but thank God for the liberal metropolitan elite. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> Not allowed back in Guildford. <laughs> I'm not saying this to be... Uh, Inflammatory, by the way. I'm not saying it's to be inflammatory. I just, I worry about us. I worry because the future's not about us. The future's not about Britain. It's not about France. It's not about Canada. It's not even about America. This is the century of China and India. These are the two superpowers of the new age. And I don't think we stand a chance against these countries. I don't think we do. Their standards are way too high. Way too, especially China, especially. Uh, give me a cheer if you remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Give me a cheer. Do you remember, do you remember the opening ceremony? Do you remember the most incredible thing anyone had ever seen in their lives? Honestly, if you think this has been good, you wait till you go home and you watch that, okay? <laughs> I am talking 5,000 soldiers doing flips at the same time. People running upside down, in the air, no wire. <laughs> Women giving birth on stage. <laughs> to babies that were already dressed and knew the choreography. It was astonishing. <laughs> And every newspaper in Britain the next day had the same question. How did they do that? How did they do that? Do you think they were asking that in China about our opening ceremony in 2012? Be honest. Do you think they were saying, how did they do that when Dizzy Rascal sang bonkers? Do you think? <laughs> now, change is coming. Change is, it's going to be hard for us. It's going to be hard for us in the UK in particular, I think. Because for all our lives, no matter how old you are, America has been the superpower. They've been the super, and we had a pretty good deal with America, all things considered. We had a pretty good, yes, they were aggressive. They ran their culture down our throat. They wouldn't shut up about it. You know, we're America. We'll put a flag on the moon. We'll put a Starbucks in your nan, you know? <laughs> they ran their culture down our throat. But the inconvenient truth was always this. They had a big old army that killed our enemies. I mean, that was the whole deal, wasn't it? That was the whole arrangement. Just keep me safe. I'll keep pretending Tom Cruise is attractive. Come on. <laughs> but now who knows what the deal's gonna be with China. It's different culture, different way of life, different country. I mean, even Tom Cruise, Hollywood, bow to China. All the Hollywood films now have to appeal to China first. I don't think that's a problem, by the way. But you know, the Chinese government, they vet the films. They edit the Hollywood films. Makes sense, of course. But it's a weird use of China's sudden wealth and power, don't you think? Influencing Hollywood after <laughs> centuries of pulling themselves up. What are you gonna do? You're gonna close the sweatshops? You're gonna bring in democracy? No, no, no. Let's make sure The Rock doesn't do anything gay. <laughs> Just do that. <laughs> I get razzed a lot because I get a lot of Americans who are like, ah, oh, Canadian army? You guys don't have an army. You guys, are, what do you guys have, like a bear? And I'm like, yeah, you know what, don't, dis don't disrespect my country like that, right? I would have to respect your country, don't disrespect mine. And second of all, we have two bears, okay? So fuck off. <laughs> You've seen them in the Coca-Cola com Christmas commercials. He's got bills to pay, okay? He's gotta go back to his igloo, fuck off. <laughs> But it's crazy though, even with the American army, I think we should get rid of Canadian soldiers. You know what we should replace Canadian soldiers with? Canadian geese. Have you seen these fucking assholes? These geese just like, ah, 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 ah. they're, holy shit, just ring, ah, 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 ah. oh my God. That, we should say Canadian geese to the Middle East. That's how we get rid of the Taliban. That's just, just like death to the Middle East, death, death to America, death to the infidels, and what the fuck is this? Ah, 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 ah. Bro, he bit my toe. He bit my fucking toe right there. He bit my toe off. <laughs> Don't fuck with the Canadian Army. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but it's good to be here, though. We're coming back to live shows again, live entertainment again, which is kind of nice. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Live shows is kind of cool. I'm loving this, though. Like, I did a show not long ago where the first act on stage was a beatboxer. Yeah. 
a beatboxer. And the crowd loved him, they went crazy for him. And then I got on stage next and people were like, ooh, he's gonna beatbox as well. And boy, were they disappointed. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of sad faces that day. Like, I cancel Christmas. <laughs> First of all, just look how I'm dressed, okay? I'm wearing a dress shirt, jeans, and sneakers. Do I look like a, do I look like a rapper? No. You know why? Because my favorite band is Duran Duran, okay? <laughs> yes, I've seen them twice in concert, and I'll see them again. I don't give a shit, okay? <laughs> It's fair, right? Because I say Duran Duran and white people are like, yes, oh, he's one of us. <laughs> and black people and millennials are like, who the fuck is Duran Duran? <laughs> it's pronounced Tupac, Andrew. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'm not a beatboxer. I don't listen to beatboxing music, but I can sure as hell do the Carlton dance to and I'm hungry like the wolf. <laughs> so I'm single, I don't know why, it's weird. <laughs> it's fun though, uh, like your host said, I live in LA now, which is kind of cool. A lot of uh, experiencing a lot of things in LA, but I always make sure I want to come back home for the holidays, right? I always I want to make sure I'm home for Christmas, right? But there's some people who like Halloween more than they like Christmas. Where's my Halloween fanatics? Halloween fanatics? <laughs> nice, okay. The freaks, I love you guys. <laughs> like you know, Halloween is coming when you start to see all these pop up haunted houses. You know, like I saw one haunted house. You have to be 18 and over to go inside, pay twenty dollars, and sign a waiver before you could go in this haunted house. I don't know what's scarier, paying $20 to go inside a haunted house or the fact that I'm in my 30s and I just signed a waiver to go inside a haunted house. <laughs> right? I could have spent that money on better things like buying Coke, you know, adult shit. <laughs> but I'm not gonna lie though, I actually went to this haunted house, wasn't scary at all. You know why? Because that's the exact same shit as a kid. Just people in costumes, dressing up, trying to jump out and scare you. That's not scary when you're in your 30s. You know why? Because I've gone through life. And life experiences are a lot more scary than that. You want to have a haunted house that will scare adults? It should start off with you walking inside the haunted house, and for no reason at all, the engine light in your car starts to go off. <laughs> You're like, what's wrong with it now? I just got it from the garage last week. <laughs> you go into one room, there's your landlord hoping and noticing there's been an 8% increase in rent. You go into the next room, there are nine cats standing there. Look at you going, you're 40 and single. When do we move in? <laughs> You start, <laughs> you start running down the hallway, dodging Facebook friend requests from people you haven't seen since high school, <laughs> wanting you to join their pyramid scheme. <laughs> and all these unpaid visa bills and credit card bills and tax forms are flying it at you. A notice drops down from the ceiling. It's a letter from your insurance saying that they will no longer provide coverage because you have what is known as a pre-existing condition. A trap door opens and you fall through and you start drowning in water and responsibilities and student debt. You look to one side, there's your family leaving the house you clearly can't afford and your wife might leave you and take half your shit. <laughs> On the other side is your mother standing there for arms crossed going, you should have been a doctor. <laughs> Now you see the exit sign, but as you're running towards the exit sign, you start dodging traffic cones and potholes because you remember you live in Montreal. <laughs> the OQLF sees the exit sign and goes, en français, you see? So now you gotta go back to the beginning and do the whole haunted house now in French. <laughs> So now you're running through, now you're running through the Maison Haunté. 
you see the sortie sign, but as you're running towards the sortie sign, suddenly you're 30 pounds overweight, you have a receding hairline, you now are prescription glasses, you're allergic to dairy now, when the hell did that happen? <laughs> Your back hurts because you slept wrong. Your knee hurts because you sneeze too loud. How the fuck does that make any sense? <laughs> it's 7.30 at night, you're ready to go. You're 7.30 on a Friday night, you're ready to go. You're ready to party, but you're like, I'll take a quick 30 minute nap. Close your eyes, open them up again. Now it's Monday morning, wondering where the fucking weekend went. You see the sortie sign, you kick down the door, and outside is exploding balloons, fireworks, a confetti with a giant banner that reads, congratulations, only 40 more years till retirement. That's the kind of shit that should scare you in an adult haunted house. Yeah. That and spiders, I don't like spiders at all. <laughs> oh my gosh, living in, um. Living in the States, though, has been interesting. Uh, living in the States has been interesting. We're learning a lot of stuff, right? As a comic, you get to travel, right? Doing shows in different towns, different cities, you know? As a comic, you do shows in big towns, you do shows in little towns. I don't like doing shows in small towns. That freaks me out. Why? Because I know in a small town, not a lot of minorities, right? <laughs> we know this. That's why we like to stick close to the city, where there are Witnesses, you know what I mean? <laughs> and we've seen Get Out, we know it happens in a small town now. <laughs> and fuck Vermont, we're never going there again. Mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> but one time I had to do a show in a small town called uh, Lake Havasu, Arizona. Right? I don't know if you guys have ever been to Lake Havasu, but imagine Trumpers on boats, basically. That's, <laughs> that's basically what it is, right? But if you guys have never been, skip it, here's why. <laughs> so I'm, on, I'm uh, doing some casinos in Arizona, Nevada, right? So I'm on stage doing what I'm doing right now. I bring the headliner on stage, I get off stage. As I'm walking to the back of the room, this little old lady grabs my arm and says, hey, I just wanted to say thank you for coming and making us laugh in this small, boring town. That's what she said, small, boring town. I said, ma'am, it's my pleasure to make people laugh in big towns, make people laugh in small towns, and inject a little humor along the way. And she replies, and inject a little color too. <laughs> you know you live in a white town when even white people say, we need some black people here, this is. This is terrifying. It is all white and it is not all right. This is terrifying. What is, what is this, Lord of the Flies? What is going on here? We, we need some brothers because nobody can dance with rhythm. This is scary. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do with this information now, right? <laughs> so I married her. That's right. Yeah. Inject a little color of my own. You know what I'm saying, brother? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I have a black family in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> You know what the worst part is? Now I have a boat there too. It's bullshit. <laughs> this fucking rules, you all. It has means so much to me and thank you all for being here and what a night. I wanna say this right off the bat. If at any point you're easily offended, oh, I don't fucking care. Like I truly don't give a shit. If anything I say upsets you, fuck off, like legitimately. And I wanna say, Times are crazy. I want you to know I'm carrying a knife because of some shit that happened at the Oscars. You know, so I'm, I am fully armed on stage right now. And I'm gonna be honest with you all. I don't know how to hold this fucking thing. Which actually makes it feel far more dangerous, doesn't it? The fact that I'm holding my knife like that feels like it'd fall out of my hand at any time. Get up on stage. Say what you want to say. Do it. Yes, I'm armed. God, what a time to be alive. Oh, God.
I, uh, oh, I also want you to know I walked down the aisle and I shook a bunch of hands. I shook your hands. I want to get this out of the way. I'm vaccinated before anybody fucking gets weird about it. I did the vet. You don't even have to woo it. I don't know why the fuck I did it. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I grew up in Maine uh, in the middle of just, uh, yeah, uh, the person who wooed, never been to Maine. I mean, it's a shit. <laughs> People are always like, Maine, that's gorgeous. You like lighthouses and warm butter with your lobster. But there is eight hours of buggy, hot, and somehow cold all at the same time. <laughs> Racist inland, and that's where I'm from. And so, but I want you to know, I grew up in a small town, which means I don't know why I got the vaccine. I, I'm chock full, I am a pinata of deep Reddit ideas. Like I am <laughs> just, full of like conspiracy theories and shit like that. My upbringing was so Stephen King. Like, I'm serious. I grew up in an area that was so Stephen King. I remember that the first time that me and my friends saw the movie Stand By Me, our only criticism of the movie was, oh yeah, it's a fine fucking movie and all, but if their dads are such bad alcoholics, how come their treehouse is finished? <laughs> our only criticism of the movie. <laughs> because if you grew up in a rural area like we did, where all your friends' dads were alcoholics, you didn't get a treehouse like they had. You didn't get that cedar plank Howard Johnson's a reasonable 12 feet off the ground. What you got was four or five boards that your dad, in a rare moment of sobriety, before any of a dozen funerals that summer, nailed in the crook of a birch tree 45 fucking feet in the air. It was the most unsafe thing in three states. So we saw that movie and we were like, that's fucking Hollywood bullshit. Yeah, fuck that shit. But the rest of the movie, spot on. Yeah, good fucking flick. A freight train will do that to a body. That's true. Yeah. I got, I did, I went... I went and got the vaccine, and I get I don't know why the fuck I did it. I was one of those people that was out there, like, just out going, hey, take the vaccine! Read the science! I want to be clear to you all. I've read none of the science. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to sell you on the, I don't know what the fuck was in that thing. <laughs> That thing may kill me. I don't know, I don't know. I have no fucking clue. I just decided a while ago that I would rather die than live on the planet with a bunch of anti-vaxxers. And, but wait, before you, no, stop. See, you think I'm saying I don't like anti-vaxxers or I'm, no, I'm saying that not because I hate anti-vaxxers, but can you imagine how insufferable they're gonna be if they get this one right? Like really, like really think about it. They've been wrong on a number of occasions. And then they reel in the biggest fucking fish of all time. You think they're ever gonna let you lift that down? There's no fucking way. Every doctor after that, if they knew you took the vaccine and survived, they're gonna be like, oh, what's the matter with you? I don't know, I think I got shingles right on. Hey, you know what? Make him put a pine cone in his ass. <laughs> what? Put a pine cone in your ass. That doesn't even sound like medicine. Oh, it doesn't, does it, vaccine boy? Because I think you were wrong a couple times before. Now I want you to go with the uh, pedals going up. Okay, you got, that's the only way it works. I can't be an anti-vaxxer. I drive a Hyundai Elantra. That Punisher sticker is gonna take up the entire back window on that car. I won't be able to see out the rear window on that fucking thing. It's crazy. I want you to know, people are like, why are people so vaccine hesitant now? Me, I'm the reason. I'm telling you, people are hesitant for vaccines because of my generation. That's it. I'm a child of the 90s. Like, I play in a punk band. I still tour in a punk band. I still love playing punk rock. I've been playing in bands since I was 15 years old. Do you know how many songs I wrote that were like, fuck the government! <laughs> Never do what you told! <laughs> Do you know how much I love Rage Against? How many of us in the 90s were listening to, fuck you, I won't do what you tell? Yeah. Do you know how much?
bunch of us love that song. I've seen memes going around like, remember when we said, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, and now we're getting in line? We did all say that. I want to be clear. I said that. I did say all that. But I want to be clear about something. We didn't mean, don't take medicine. I want to be clear about that. That's not what we were talking about. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, maybe if you're um, like Zach Delaroca, a person of color, and you're in a city in like Los Angeles, and there's a notoriously racist police uh, organization policing your city, and you get pulled over, and they want to go search your stuff, hold your middle finger up. If they don't have probable cause, that's your right. Or maybe you're like I am, and you go to a redneck school, and you're born genetically a man, but you identify as a different gender, and you just want to live the way you want to live without a bunch of morons ruining your fucking day. Stand up. I'll stand with you. I will. Not horse medicine! <laughs> Unless you're at a rave, then take horse medicine! That's the way it works! And if you have too much of the horse medicine, go back to the people medicine! That's the way it's always worked! Horse medicine is recreational! <laughs> No one actually tries to solve shit with it. <laughs> I have so many friends though, who are like, you need to fucking tell off your family members if they, if they are anti-vaxxers, you need to, I'm not gonna be part of disowning members of my family, not gonna do it. People want you to just sh sh cut off people who don't agree, I'm not gonna be a part of it. These people raised me, they're good people, they like, do I agree with them? I don't. But it, I have friends on the left who are like, can you fucking believe that these people are taking horse medicine? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> you'd say you'd put that in your body? I, I used to huff gas. <laughs> Like a, like a fair amount of gasoline. Yeah, I mean, from 98 to 01, I was a gas sommelier. I could get one nostril in the can of a, of a five gallon tank and just be like, Ugh, you know, I'm getting notes of scutch grass and mesquite. I'm gonna say this is an 89 that came in off the coast of Galveston. And I'll tell you what, fuck me if I'm wrong. That's some good shit, woo! During this pandemic, we are seeing things that are unimaginable, right? And as a person of color, I'm seeing things I never thought I would see. I never thought me and two black friends walking into a bank would be told to put on a mask. <laughs> black people, you get it, right? You want me to put that on and go in there? I never thought I would see that. You know what that's like? That's like two black people winning the cornhole championship of the world. <laughs> you see how the black people didn't laugh? Because they don't know what the hell cornhole is. <laughs> I never thought a furniture store could be racist during a pandemic. Now, we just celebrated Juneteenth. It's a national holiday. It's on the calendar now, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful situation. Now, if you don't know what it means, it means it's the emancipation of the last black American slaves. Yeah. But one Ikea store, they wanted to celebrate too. This is a true story. Look it up when you leave. On Juneteenth, they serve chicken and watermelon. <laughs> I was just like, y'all, I was mad. I got offended, you know? Because when I got there, they were out of watermelon. I was like, this is what?
I never thought I would almost die from coronavirus. March 17th of last year, I woke up gasping for air. It's so new, less than 100 people died from it. My wife calls 911. The operator has to look it up, a black lady named Teresa. She goes, ooh, it could be COVID. He could be contagious. Then there's a long pause on the phone. Then she says, girl, you better get away from him. <laughs> My wife goes, what I do? She says, put him in the front yard. I'm like, <laughs> like I'm trash? My wife looks at me and goes, you got to go. But I'm a man, I'm like, hell no, I'm staying in my house. I ain't going no front yard. So now I'm sitting in the front yard. <laughs> Gasping for air. The ambulance comes, they put oxygen on me. They say, say goodbye to your family. Now, I can't touch my family because I got COVID, right? So my wife is at the front door with my son and a window separates us. They're crying, I'm crying. So I walk up to the window and put my hand on it where my son is, gasping for air. <gasps> my three-year-old son puts his hand on top of my hand, looks at me and goes, <gasps> this little motherfucker making fun of me, man. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. But the comedian in me was like, his timing's incredible. <laughs> so they put me in an ambulance. Now, if you've never been in an ambulance, it's a scary ride. You don't know what's going to happen on the other side, right? And they put your neck in a brace, so all you can do is look up. And while I'm looking up at the ceiling, I'm going, you know what? They should put some motivational quotes up here or something. <laughs> something to put you at ease, you know what I mean? Like, you only live once. <laughs> Enjoy the ride. OJ did it. <laughs> so I get to the hospital. Lots of doctors and nurses waiting on me, and this is when I found out something interesting. The guy that rolled me out of the ambulance was like, you're our first COVID patient. Good luck. <laughs> So they send me into a room. They take every blood test, every x-ray they could, right? Then they leave the room. About 30 minutes later, I see all the doctors in front of my room in a window, right? And they're just talking like <laughs> And then I see them draw straws, and one goes, fuck! <laughs> and that dude walks in. He's scared. He told me less than 100 people died from COVID. So it was new, and he was like nervous, and he goes, well, uh, here's what's happening. Your lungs are filling up with fluid, and you have double pneumonia and corona. So I look at the doctor and go, what's that mean? He goes, well, it's gonna go really good, or really bad. <laughs> and we'll know in about two days. And then it start to sink in, I go, whoa, 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 this is serious. I'm gonna make it, right? He looks me straight in the eye and goes, We'll try our best. <laughs> Yo! You always want people to try their best, right? But you never want someone to tell you they're trying their best. You ever drop your car off to a mechanic, pick it up, and you're like, hey man, did you fix my brakes? And the dude's like, yeah, you know what, we tried our best. <laughs> So they put me in ICU. I'm the only person in ICU. It's new. It's new. Now, this is the only thing I'm going to say about vaccines. I don't care if you're on them or not on them. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your body. But if you're not on them, please do not say, I don't want to get the shot because I don't want to be a guinea pig. You're not a guinea pig. You know how I know this? Because I was a guinea pig. Because <laughs> the doctor walked into my room and went, we don't know what we're doing. So we got to give you everything. And they did. I was like a whore, and the drugs were like dicks, and I was just taking them all in the mouth. Ah, ah. I got gang banged by experimental drugs. The first one they gave me, hydroxychloroquine. 
I had an allergic reaction to it. My temperature shot up to 104.8, almost died that night. But this is the last thing you ever want to hear your doctor say as he leaves the room. He saved my life. He's leaving the room. He looks back at me and goes, man, we learned something new today. <laughs> Now, as I'm dying in the hospital, I'm watching TV. And there's a group of people on TV saying it's a hoax. Now, you know what these people look like. I don't have to describe them to you. If a Cracker Barrel exploded, and landed on a Walmart <laughs> and drove off in an F-150. <laughs> so they were supposed to tell me if I was gonna live or die in two days, it took them four days, right? The doctor said, you're doing so well, we're actually gonna let you go on the fifth day. So on the fifth day, I'm getting ready. I'm putting on all my clothes. All the doctors run into my room and go, no, 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 lay back down, lay back down, lay back down. You can't leave. I go, what's the matter, doc, what's the matter? He goes, oh man, we just let somebody go home and they died. I was like, shit. <laughs> you can keep me in this bitch forever. I'm not going anywhere, you know? Put me at the front desk, I'll answer phones. I don't care. What was happening is they were letting people go home, they would relapse and couldn't make it back to the hospital. Or if they did make it back to the hospital, it was too packed and they couldn't take them, right? So they evaluated me for three more days. Now remember, it's still new. So on the eighth day, they're letting me out of the hospital, out of ICU. Doctor looks at me, we're at the exit, me and the doc. He looks at me and goes, hey man, you need to quarantine. I go, how long? He goes, Ah, <sighs> <laughs> uh, hmm. 22 days? <laughs> cool. I'm at home for 22 days quarantine. Let me tell you what my beautiful wife is going through. She's alone. We have a three-year-old son and a two-month-old daughter. So for 22 days, I'm hearing my kids yell, scream. My son's asking where daddy is. My wife is losing her mind. I'm getting breakfast, lunch, and dinner delivered to my room. <laughs> I'm like, damn, COVID ain't that bad. I feel like a husband in the 50s, you know what I mean? I'm like, get those kids away from me, bitch, where's my dinner? But I gotta say, man, I gotta say, to all the doctors, nurses, frontline workers that are here tonight, thank you for what you do. You are the real heroes. Yeah. Yep. So, I became good friends with my doctor, uh, of course, because he saved my life, right? And they test my blood all the time because I was one of the first patients that beat COVID that they didn't put on a ventilator. So the doctor calls me up for a uh, blood test to see if I need a booster or not. And he goes, well, here's your results. If your level is over 20, you don't need a booster. If your level is under 20, you need a booster. I go, all right, doc, what's my level? He goes, your level is 2,500. <laughs> you have 120 times more antibodies than you need. The highest number I've ever seen during this pandemic is 700, and your level is 2,500. <laughs> That's right. I hung up the phone, looked at my wife, and said, I'm a goddamn superhero. <laughs> I'm the half Black Panther. <laughs> Do you realize I could sneeze on someone and cure them? <laughs> Shake my hand, sir. <laughs> You're vaccinated. <laughs> Fist bump. Booster! <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you, I got too cocky after the doctor told me this. I got way too cocky, way too cocky. I was doing everything I wasn't supposed to do. Yeah, I was going out, touching everything. I was opening doors for everybody. 
did not care. I opened the door for a little old lady. She was like, do you need some hand sanitizer? I was like, oh, hell no. I am hand sanitizer. I lived a life without fear. Everything I was afraid of had no fear of anymore. A cop pulled me over and was like, do you know why I stopped you? I was like, no, bitch, and just drove off. I was like, what? This is what it feels like to be white. What? I didn't do that. Uh-uh, I'm still half black. I ain't doing that to a cop. Oh, hell no. And I, uh, visiting here from uh, Chicago, coming from Chicago. Yeah, yeah, you've heard of it, you small town fucks. You ever heard of Chicago, you little bum fuck dogs, you cousin fuckers? You ever heard of it? Small town piece of shit? You ever heard of it? <laughs> nah, I grew up in Woodbury. It's good to be back. Good to be back. I love Woodbury. What a place. So, they anyone live there? Are you anyone from there? Yeah. Dan, I know you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What a fucking dump, right? What a dump. I love it. I love it. This is a little Woodbury story, I think, as they really encapsulate how I grew up. In like fifth grade, we went to this Catholic school and we took a month off of gym class so everyone could get their boating license. <laughs> <laughs> They were like, yeah, physical activity is important if you're poor, am I right? <laughs> you bring your boat to class, Jimmy? <laughs> you brought a canoe, go to Afton, you hippie bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite Minnesota laws. I learned this when I was a kid, is that until you're 18, you gotta take like this month long class to get your boating license. But once you're 18, anyone can drive a boat. <laughs> They're like, you're 18, you know how to vote and boat, baby. Vote and boat. <laughs> but which way do I go around to boo? You've had a hand job, you know. You can figure it out. <laughs> Oh, man, Minnesota's great. Mall of America, we love the Mall of America, right? What a place. I love it. I love going there. You go to the Mall of America for like 15 minutes, and you're like, well, maybe ISIS has a point. You know what I see? Uh, I, I see why they hate us, you know? We should just let them bomb it once a year, warn the workers, get those fairboat tourists, kill them, right? <laughs> okay, that was too much, that was too much. You don't like me, that's great. Uh, good, glad you went set up front. Uh, <laughs> that beer cheese thing, that rock, dude. I'm sorry I had to hear you say that, but that was funny, that ripped, that ripped. Yeah, good. <laughs> I love Minnesota. I, lo I, grew I lived in New York for a few years. I don't know if you guys know, but New York hates Minnesota. They hate middle America, they think we're all like these fucking idiots like living in cheese teepees or whatever like I, uh, I had a friend and he literally said to me he's like do you guys in Minnesota you guys have Amazon Prime there <laughs> and I was like yeah we're pretty pumped about it we got it last year you know we're like, <laughs> they said if we're responsible next year we'll get bubble tea <laughs> I love uh, driving here from Chicago. You got to go through all those like little small farm towns. I love. You ever notice that every little small farm town in the Midwest is like a like a bizarre annual festival that they're like way too proud of, right? <laughs> they're like, yeah, you got to come to Waterford on October 14th for our duck hat festival, dude. <laughs> we make these little paper hats and we chase the ducks around the pond. Whoever puts the most hats on the most ducks is mayor. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Like, it's like all these little, like, small farming towns that still think Dippin' Dots are the ice cream of the future. <laughs> like, if we had a crate of Dippin' Dots, that'd stop this polio epidemic, buddy. <laughs> Another thing I think is so funny about small towns here, you ever notice that every small town has like a, like a big park in the middle with like a fucking tank in it? <laughs> They'll have like a World War II tank and two artillery guns pointed at the one liberal house. <laughs> They're like, yeah, can universal health care cure a fucking tank, libtard? <laughs> Like they got more work in tanks than certified teachers. You know? <laughs> Incredible. I get to travel a lot doing comedy, I think it's fun. One thing I've learned, I think this is true everywhere, it's probably true here too, is that every city 
thinks that a city like 40 miles away is like filled with fucking idiots like that. That's how we like feel good like in Minneapolis. Everyone's like, yeah, fucking Owatonna. They're dumb <laughs> as shit, dude. But then you go to Owatonna, they're like, no, 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 we're actually really smart. Albert Lee, that's the dumb city, you know? <laughs> then you go to Albert Lee and they're like, no, no, it's Winona. They're the fucking dumb city. And it keeps going. I think this chain ends at a village in the middle of Kansas where everyone's like, yeah, man, we fucking suck! <laughs> we don't even have a duck hat festival. <laughs> what happened there? That sucks. <laughs> Glad to be here, very fun. My mom's here, my family's here, very cool. I, uh, yeah, give it up for him, give it up for him. I, uh, I have a very dark sense of humor and I think it's because my mom, my mom is a very dark fucking weird woman. I, <laughs> also, just a little moment of silence. I thought, you know how white people are always like, I have a black friend? I guess I do not have a black friend. <laughs> I kind of thought I was cooler than this. Uh, <laughs> okay, that, that ruined that joke. Uh, but my mom, I know I have a dark sense of humor. It all started when I was like, I think I was like four or five years old. I'll never forget this. My mom woke me up one morning by like kicking in my door and screaming, your dog is dead. <laughs> And then she left me to cry for like 10 minutes and then she came back and was like, April Fool's sweetheart. <laughs> so like, why don't you guys trust women? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get her in the nursing home though. I'll get her. I, uh, <laughs> tell her her daughter died a different way every day. Uh, <laughs> convince her she's got another daughter then that daughter dies the next day <laughs> I just, that's funny cool cool we're having fun uh yeah i have a girlfriend uh yeah yeah pretty brave of me to be straight these days honestly uh sorry i like pussy whoopsie uh <laughs> women aren't thrilled about it either <laughs> They're like, can't you be gay? I'm like, sorry, lady, it's not a choice. You know, like, like if I could choose what I was into sexually, I'd probably choose to be into dogs, probably. You know, like, dogs are always trying to fuck me in the park. You know, like, never have a woman try to slob my knob in the park. You know, fucking golden doodles want this. You know, like, I do. I brought, I brought my girlfriend home to visit my family recently. Uh, it's always a big moment to bring a girlfriend to visit your family because you get to have that like real quiet sex in your childhood bed, right? <laughs> like the whole time I'm like, give it to daddy, but don't wake father. <laughs> The whole time I'm like making eye contact with my stuffed animals, like, I told you I'd do it one day. <laughs> you never believed in me, you dumb moose. <laughs> Thanks for letting me practice on you, bro. <laughs> yeah. Right, buddies? We fucked them, right, man? <laughs> Call me a taxidermist because I stuffed that moose, okay? Uh, <laughs> Martin Moose, best sex of my life, by far, by far. He was really religious, never had to wear a condom, that rocked. Uh, <laughs> okay, cut that line, cut that line, okay. <laughs> Uh, I broke up with my girlfriend like two months ago, uh, but that joke fucking rips, so I gotta keep telling it. <laughs> it also ripped when I entered the moose. Uh, <laughs> let's all close our eyes and think about that for a second. What a fun visual. Uh, okay. cool, cool, cool. We're having fun. Uh, I am, I'm trying to, I'm single, trying to get out there more, trying to spread my cum around like my mom told me to. Uh, <laughs> She's like, Jeff, spread your cum. Uh, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> okay, I didn't mean to say that. That was not planned. One, the one way I have more confidence in the better, one thing I do is I don't listen to music during sex anymore. I hate listening to music during sex because I don't like having like physical evidence for how long it was, right? <laughs> like I like when she's like, we didn't even make it to the lyrics of Mambo Number no. 5. <laughs> I'm like, I swear, babe, I usually get to a little bit of Monica. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> a little off tonight. <laughs> I do come quick, and I think that's chill as hell, honestly. Uh, it is. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> the guy who wears a baseball cap out in public? Yeah, you come quick. <laughs> Very sure, very sure. Love it, love it. It's very feminist to come quick. People don't know it's a big feminist decision to come quickly. I do it because I really respect women. I come right away because, uh, ladies, I want to get back to talking about your day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> For me, sex is like, oh, so what were you saying? You know? <laughs> I tire of this sex. <laughs> Yeah, you got bad at sex. When you're bad at sex, man, you got to go down to women, right, buddy? You do that? Yeah, you got the beard. You got the beard. <laughs> you have need to use your mouth. You can eat and do it at the same time. <laughs> eat and eat all at once. That's funny. Uh, okay. Keep that. Keep that. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to go down to women a lot. I think I'm pretty good at it, too, because women always say, that's enough. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. okay, okay. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Women only ask me to go down them once, though. I think it's like, yeah, you only go to Paris once, baby. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, that was my favorite line. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. I, I, know, I always get nervous to go down on women because, like, I have trouble activating the adhesive on an envelope. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That one's fun to look around because like the women laugh and the men are like looking at the women. <laughs> Can, do we find this funny, honey? <laughs>